The View from Gaza. We chat with our Middle East correspondent about what it's like to report on a war from the heart of the conflict. And later, the place of modern pilgrimage in our world. I'm Madeline White. Welcome to Globe Now. The Globe and Mail's Patrick Martin has watched a lot of history unfold in the Middle East in his 30 years covering the region. And most recently, he was in Gaza reporting on the current conflict. Patrick Martin flew back into Canada over the weekend and joins me now to talk about what it's like to report in such a volatile place. Welcome, Patrick. Hi. So right now on the internet, there are tons of photos being shared, purporting to be destruction in Gaza, showing things like boys being handcuffed to tanks. Mm. Is any of this true? Tell us what you actually saw in Gaza. Well, there's a couple of Gazas. One is the urban centers, which is a very old part of Gaza. And they have reasonably high office buildings, sometimes residential buildings as high as 10 or 15 floors. There's a few of those. The other big part of the country are the refugee camps, cinder block, block construction, beginning in 48, low level. They've actually grown to about three-story buildings. So there are those areas. There's another area that's wide open sections of the country. There's a lot of that, actually. They farm there. They raise cattle, or sheep anyway. And it's an interesting uh, combination of these things. But it's simple construction, basic. What I saw was an awful lot of bombardment of the outlying areas, gradually working their way closer and closer into the city centers like Gaza City, which was hit just a couple of few days ago. Are neighborhoods totally razed to the ground at this point? Some areas have been. Hmm. The Shajaya neighborhood, which is east of Gaza City, where the big battle took place eight days ago on a Sunday, they, they did fight intensively and have fought intensively there. Heavy bombardment the night before and since then. That's really been devastated, no question about that. But the primary where they send rockets from, Gaza City and Beit Lahia, have not been hit very much at all. Sporadic hitting, they can't get at the big rocket centers because they're right in the middle of populated areas. Hmm. Interesting. Now, as a journalist, how do you stay safe when you go out to witness <laughs> all of this? It can be tough. I like to take a trip outside every day. You get up in the morning and just see what's been done overnight, a little bit of that. Um, few people are comfortable doing that, including my own fixer sometimes. So he'll give me a guide as to where it might be good to see. I want to go somewhere where I see some evidence of, of destruction or, or not, but I don't want to go to an area that's particularly quiet and, and safe. So you, you do go out. You know, we wear bulletproof vests and armor-proof vests that help to some degree, helmets that are pretty good. So we can take shrapnel in those areas, but it's still, it's still pretty dangerous. Now, there came a point with this current conflict where editors here, at least, were just about one thing and one thing only, which was get Patrick out of Gaza <laughs> safely. How did you go about doing that? Well, there's an opportunity. There are only a few opportunities. And, and this one particular day, the IDF and the ICRC, the Red Cross, had organized a, a, a bus to take any internationals who wanted to get out or needed to get out to the border, and then you'd go through to the Israeli side. Um, it was a little tense that day because the opportunities were few. They hadn't done it before. But the most distressing thing is that when we pulled up the first one there, wait for the bus, and the others who were joining us, we heard gunfire break out, not far from us at all, and mm -hmm. ricochets that hit off metal something metal. We got the hell out of there fast yeah. because it was it was not expected. That was it was supposed to be a calm area, but someone was shooting at someone. And we don't know who. So we took off, came back later when the bus came. There was still some shooting. No one was hit. We got on the bus, but the worst problem came that after we passed where the Hamas normally has its checkpoint, they weren't there that day, and the Palestinian Authority has a checkpoint, they weren't there. We arrived at the spot where we were to cross over and go on this long covered walkway, a kilometer and a half to the Israeli building where they'll do the security checks. We then tried to go in and found that the door was locked. Mm -hmm. The turnstile that they had used to get out only went in one direction. We couldn't make it go in reverse. We couldn't get the lock off the door. We tried lifting the door out of the way. It stuck in an odd position we couldn't get through. We called the IDF and said, what do we do? They said, well, we didn't realize this was going to happen. And shells are going off on one side of us, shells are going off on the other side of there us. There you were stranded. We, said, this is not, we don't want to go back this way because that's a mass. We don't want to walk on the road to the checkpoint without going in through this area because the soldiers on the Israeli side may shoot at us. Uh, they would wonder, why are we there? So they said, well, we'll clear it. They checked it. After a while, they said, we've been assured they won't shoot at you. So we eventually walked at a kilometer and a half in the glaring sun with all of our gear in our and our heavy vests and helmets and stuff. So we were dripping wet when we arrived, but mm -hmm. we did make it through eventually safely. So tell me about what it was like covering this conflict once you were in Israel. How different was that? This time the Israelis were frightened. I'd never seen that before. Hmm. During the Second Intifada, they were afraid of suicide bombings and that sort of thing. They wouldn't go on buses. And there was, there was that kind of danger lurching. But every single day, rockets were flying at cities that had never been attacked before. Tel Aviv, Hadera, the airport area even as far north as Haifa on one occasion, Jerusalem, lots of cities that had always thought, oh, well, 
these, this rocket's from Hamas. That's a problem for the southern towns, you know, and cities near the south. We don't need to worry about it. Suddenly they did. Now, they have a, a, a system for shooting down these rockets, the Iron Dome system, mm -hmm. which seems to work fantastically well. And they would shoot down the ones that were likely to hit urban centers. One thing that Hamas learned, though, the more rockets they shot at the same time at the same target, one or two might get through. That's how they got very close to the airport on one occasion. Right. One of them got through in a salvo. Suddenly, they realized Hamas was staying around to fight, which they hadn't done before, on mm -hmm. the ground. Suddenly, they were seeing rockets coming to their doorstep, which hadn't happened before, more powerful rockets than ever before. They suddenly realized they were facing a serious adversary in, in the battle, and that had never been the case. Now, you've covered the region for so long. You've witnessed so many of these conflicts. Do you hold out hope that there is peace on the horizon for this region? There is, in, in theory, a logical compromise between the Israelis and Palestinians, which could have seen creation of two states. But it seems not to be based on logic much anymore. Right. Both sides are insisting on a much higher target than just an equal share of, or, a, a, or a, a, co a compromise solution. This current conflict isn't going to happen. Isn't going to happen anytime soon. I don't think mm -hmm. we may see a ceasefire, but just like the ceasefire of 2012 or of 2009, it will only be a prolonging of the war. They'll wait two, three years and come back at it again, unless they confront some of the core issues. Well, we are lucky to have you there covering it for us. So thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Even though Patrick is back in Canada, he's still closely following the events in the Middle East. You can read his reports in upcoming issues of the Globe and Mail. The Middle East is also home to several of the world's religions, and cities like Jerusalem and Bethlehem draw pilgrims from around the world. But what is the place of modern pilgrimage in a tech-savvy world? Well, a new documentary looks at a journey that stretches 800 kilometers across Spain. For centuries, it has been a pilgrimage route for the faithful. So who are the modern-day pilgrims? You'll be surprised. I think the idea of pilgrimage is is lost in our modern-day society. The Camino de Santiago is a 500-mile-long spiritual pilgrimage. Most people start in France, but starting in France means that you walk over the Pyrenees and then walk across the country of Spain. So I'm one of the six of the six ways to Santiago. Even though you are walking to a destination, because it takes so long, the reasons that you're walking drift off and what you're really walking into is your own life. The reason why I decided to do the Camino was because my life was a mess. When I first started, I was just walking and people said to me, you will find the answer. And then I realized that I didn't have the question. And many people who walk are not religious in any sense. If you are an atheist and feel called to do the Camino, the Camino has a message to share with you. I'm not particularly religious, but on this route there's an atmosphere. It's soul searching mostly. It's uh, finding an inner peace in myself. The good news is, is you find yourself surrounded by wonderful people who are happy to walk with you, and I mean that in every sense, not just the physical sense, but to break bread with you and to help you with your blisters and talk about the day and, and talk about life. The film is playing in Toronto this month and will be showing in Vancouver, Ottawa, Victoria, London and Winnipeg in coming months. That's all for today's show. If you've got a moment, hop onto Twitter. Would you consider participating in a pilgrimage? If so, what kind of pilgrimage would appeal to you? Tweet us at GlobeNow. I'm Madeline White. Thanks for watching.